On today's episode, I'm joined by the award-winning author of seven major books, including the explosive New York Times bestseller, American Compromot. He goes into detail about how the KGB has been cultivating Russian assets on American soil through massive business loans, money laundering, and honey trapping since the Cold War era. And most recently, how the Jeffrey Epstein crime ring has permeated the underbelly of Washington. You're gonna want to fasten your seatbelts for this one, guys. So without further ado, here is my conversation with author Craig Unger, and this is Uncovering the Truth. Craig, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. Sure. Well, let's just get right into it. Obviously, there's the elephant in the room here. You know, before we spoke, the FBI, we just found out they're looking for nuclear documents at Mar-a-Lago. And this brought up, this, this made me think about your book, The American Compromot, where you actually discussed in the 80s, Donald Trump had an obsession with, you know, being involved in nuclear foreign policy with the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty talks. And he actually put out that piece in the New York Times you know, are arguing as well that we need to stop defending Japan. And, and it seems to me that his obsession with, with nu nuclear foreign policy and as well his populist movement to, to kind of cut off our allies is a recurring theme. And I, I'm wondering, do these new revelations at Mar-a-Lago kind of reaffirm your theory that he is still, in fact, a foreign asset or a Russian asset? Well, yes, I think, I think he is a Russian asset. And, and I mean, and in the book, I go back... Uh, as more than 40 years to 1980, uh, when you see for the first time Trump is approached by uh, a man who, who is uh, allegedly a spotter agent for the KGB, and, he, and this is Trump's first successful real estate adventure, the, the Grand Hyatt Hotel here in, in New York, right next to Grand Central Station. And like any hotel, it needed TV sets, and he ended up getting them from a guy named Semyon Kislin, who's still around and, uh, uh, according to my sources, was a, um, a spotter agent for the KGB. And that meant he, he, he uh, looked out for people who the KGB could recruit as assets. And, and I, I trace over the next 40 years, very, Trump is flown to Moscow by the KGB. Um, I, I had long talks with... Um, a former major in the KGB, Yuri Spitz, who, who was a KGB agent in Washington at the time when his own colleagues in New York were, were starting to cultivate Trump. So you see this, and again, uh, as, you, as you pointed out, uh, even back then it was related to nuclear power. I mean, that, that's one of the things that in, in the current uh, controversy after the FBI uh, search of, of Mar-a-Lago, we're seeing more and more that it absolutely had to do with classified intelligence. And now we're learning that it had to do with nuclear stuff as well. So this raises a whole bunch of possibilities, not just with Russia, but also with the Saudis. I mean, it, it's worth remembering uh, that Michael Flynn had, uh, was trying to transfer nuclear technology to the Saudis. It's worth remembering that Jared Kushner, the president's, former president's uh, son-in-law just got $2 billion in investment from the Saudis. Well, what did the Saudis get in return? And does, do, do these nuclear uh, secrets have anything to, to do with it? <laughs> so it's funny about, yeah, the, these big questions, I, I feel as if they, they should have been addressed m much longer ago, right? I mean, obviously the Saudi uh, Jared Kushner deal was, we found that out about six months ago. And, you know, perhaps maybe they, they, they have been clearly investigating and they just got the green light with the search warrant to go in. But I think what, what you're talking about is interesting here is that your book, I mean, you, you sound the alarm bells about proof. You've proved that he is in fact a, a Russian asset. And here we are today facing the, like, hopefully not severe and dire consequences of, of his intentions. So I, I'm just curious, why, why do you think it is that perhaps, you know, something like your book didn't immediately strike the DOJ to crack down on this? 
Well, you know, a lot of my information, people wonder why didn't the FBI do more? And the truth is, a lot of my information came from FBI files. So there's no question in my mind that the FBI knew an awful lot about this. That is, um, one thing I uncovered in my, my previous book, House of Trump, House of Putin, was that, uh, and, and th these, these are open source documents, by the way. It's not that I'm this dazzlingly, have these dazzling sources. I mean, if you've heard of the internet, if you know how to Google, you should be, and, and you keep digging and digging, almost anyone can come up with this stuff. But Trump in uh, 1984, and this was all in the files, um, was laundering money for the, for the uh, Russian mafia. And I, I don't think every American understands that the Russian mafia, unlike the Italian American mafia in the United States, they work hand in hand with the Russian government. They're effectively a state actor. They, do, they share their information with uh, Russian intelligence. So, I mean, th wow. there are records of that going back to 1984. And over the years, uh, Trump sold at least 1,300 condos under circumstances which are strongly suggest money laundering. And, and by that, I mean, uh, these are all cash transactions, no bank loan whatsoever. Um, and they are sold to anonymous beneficiaries, that is limited liability corporations and the like. And this started in as early as 1984 when a man named David Bogodin, who was part of the Russian mafia, came into Trump Tower at 721 Fifth Avenue, and he had uh, five million dollars, excuse me, six million dollars worth of cash. And by the way, uh, this was in 1984. That's about 15 million today. And he said, yeah. you take five condos and you can bet Donald Trump didn't say, oh, where did you get that money? Did that come from <laughs> uh, ill-gotten proceeds? So it, it's very hard to prosecute uh, the yeah. seller to prove that he has knowledge of where the, where the money came from. Right. It's like, a, I think what they call it willful blindness, I believe he can claim that he he had no idea. So exactly. And, and I mean, if I were a lawyer and I'm not, I think I'd make the case. Gee, he did this 1300 times. Mm -hmm. That suggests a pattern. It's not just two out of the, two or three times that he and these are very lucrative transactions. Uh, Trump knew what he was doing. Now, now th this actually, yes. Okay. He, he knew what he was doing, by the way, obviously, I, I think he gets underestimated a lot of the times that, 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 uh, you know, people call him, well, to a certain extent, he's not an intellectual, but he's obviously, he's got some sort of skill or talent to be able to, you know, work with, with the Russians this, or the Soviets at the time, and then work his way to the presidency. So like I, I'm curious about that take because maybe we see differently on that. That how you saw maybe he's a, a Russian stooge, but but I see him more as a perhaps he's just pure evil and he is purely willing to engage with our enemy to just profiteer and and exploit America. Well, to me, he's, it, everything he does smacks of being a mobster, and it's important to remember that his first lawyer, who he loved so much and idolized, Roy Cohn, mm -hmm. who was, of course, a, a lawyer to the mafia, and, and Trump has been known to scream, where's my Roy Cohn? I need a Roy Cohn. He, he means he wants someone ruthless. And Roy Cohn taught him an awful lot of things. One is to do business under the cover of attorney-client privilege and to have mm -hmm. the lawyers actually execute some of the things so that uh, they can then be excused from testifying because, oh, this happened under attorney-client privilege. And Trump, of course, has been trying to do the same again and again with executive privilege uh, in view of his presidency. Yeah, so he almost he almost views himself as the head of the KGB in America in a certain way. He's trying to change our country to to kind of reorganize in that sort of structure. Right. Well, he, he's sort of like a mob boss. And with, with his relationship with the Russians, you, you see uh, Russia as the mafia state. It's important to understand what that means exactly, because yeah. uh, as, as I mentioned, 
uh, uh, Russian intelligence works hands in hand with the Russian mafia. And when you look at the oligarchy and the kleptocracy that Putin has put together, you can see that um, what we would take as mob bosses are essentially in control of strategic resources of various industries like aluminum. Uh, uh, so, so you will have an aluminum billionaire, an oligarch like Oleg Deripaska. And aluminum is very much a strategic resource. Airplanes are made of aluminum. Mm -hmm. So uh, when, if, if he controls the aluminum industry in Ukraine, that means uh, Ukraine's air defenses are vulnerable to Russia in a lot of way. And, and we, we saw the same thing almost happen here in the United States when Deripaska was trying to make an, a deal with, in uh, Kentucky. And you, you have to wonder, would that have put uh, our uh, air uh, planes at the mercy of Russia? Well, and it's funny, Kentucky as well, right? Kentucky, the, the two senators there, I know. And th this is, this, you know, it's not even conspiratorial talk. This is just, you know, looking at some of the, the finances, both Mitch McConnell and Rand Paul's um, campaign manager, I think his name was Benton that he, they had found that there was, uh, you know, Russian money being funneled into the, to their campaigns as well. And, and Rand Paul himself was just listed as an official, you know, Russian propagandist by the Ukrainian foreign ministry. So I, I guess I'm curious, has this, ha, has Russia milked Donald Trump for what he's worth and have they infested the rest of our government or does it end with Donald Trump? Well, I don't think it does end with Donald Trump, but they, they've, they've invested a lot. They, they essentially bought the Republican Party. And you can see things. I mean, one of, one of the, the phrases I hate repeating again and again, but part of the, the real problem, the real scandal is what is legal? And when you realize we, we have laws like Citizens United, which allow huge Dark amounts of dark money to get into the electoral system. And then you start to realize that there are Russian oligarchs. I'm, I'm thinking of uh, Lenin Blavatnik, uh, who has $16 billion the last time I looked, but he's a naturalized American citizen. And he pours money wow. into the Republican Senatorial Campaign Committee. So that's a perfectly legal way of yeah. doing it. And it happens, and it's one way that Mitch McConnell, who's in charge of the Republican Senatorial Campaign Committee, can make sure it's distributed to whichever senators he uh, he likes. Wow! So yeah, I never thought about that. That that we there are there are Russian oligarchs here who can just legally uh, sway our our elections, and there's just nothing. There's there's no laws about it, which, which kind of you know yeah, <laughs> there there should be, but but there aren't. And so I just actually want to rewind to something. We were talking about the finances. And I think one of the most interesting points that you, you mentioned a lot is this company Bayrock and how they, they kind of bailed out Donald Trump after Atlantic City casino failures. Could, could you just talk about that? I thought that that's very prevalent today still as well. Sure. I, I see the money, Russian money going to Trump in at least two ways. And the first one was, uh, money laundering that I just explained. But uh, around 2002, you, it, it, we have to remember what a lousy business on Donald Trump is. He had bankruptcy after bankruptcy after bankruptcy. And when he expanded into Atlantic City with one casino after another, he overexpanded and he went belly up. He was billions of dollars in debts. Mm -hmm. But uh, after that happened, around 2002, a company called Bayrock, the Bayrock Group, uh, opened its offices uh, in, in uh, Trump Tower. It's a real estate development company, or it was. Uh, it was located on the 24th floor, just two floors below Trump's own office. And people whose names may be, have been forgotten by now, but I, I don't know if, if your uh, listeners remember Felix Sater, mm. who was the managing director of Bayrock, and who, through his father, had ties to the Russian mafia. Um, and, and when you look at this, this Bayrock group, uh, the money came in uh, from Russian sources, the one from Atlantic, Icelandic bank that was used by the Russian mafia, uh, the FL group. Uh, other came in from a, um, a guy named Tamir Sapir. Um, and, and 
And the principals in Bayrock, uh, virtually all of them, had ties to Russian intelligence in one way or another. And the deal they set up with Trump was, was just enormously lucrative. Um, they basically, Trump didn't have to put up a penny to develop these new uh, skyscrapers. Um, he didn't actually have to uh, develop, do the development work. They were doing that for them. They were just uh, franchising it, use it, taking his name and giving him in return 17 to 25% of the profits, which is uh, a huge percentage if you're familiar with the franchise world. world. Uh, big blue chip franchise uh, outfits like Hyatt or uh, um, uh, Marriott uh, mm -hmm. offer much, much less if you want to start a Marriott hotel. <laughs> yeah, I, I maybe I should start a Marriott now <laughs> or, or a Trump Tower. But so I just want to, but what, but what is Trump? Sorry, what is what do the Russians get out of this? Like, it can't just be them banking and praying that he becomes the president, right? Because that would be an, a ludicrous investment and just a wild prediction on their end. Or, or did they just did they just cultivate him all the way and they they they're much smarter than we are? <laughs> well, the, well, they were cultivating hundreds and hundreds of, of, of people in the United States. He was just one of them. And I, I, in the beginning, there's no question this was not some genius who figured out a 40 year plot <laughs> and, and uh, implemented it. No, it didn't work that way. What, what, what's important to understand is uh, KGB tri tradecraft. And they wanted people, they, they often, there's a difference between an agent and an asset. Uh, here in New York, there were hundreds and hundreds of, of Soviet spies in the Cold War, and many of them were based in the United Nations, especially the, the UN General Assembly Library, and, and uh, at least a couple of those people did approach uh, Trump and were sort of intermediaries in, in getting him there. And they start to cultivate people first as assets. There's a difference between an asset and an agent. An agent is someone who knows uh, exactly what the relationship that he has with the KGB or whatever intelligence service is. He knows he can be tasked and given very specific missions. Um, mm -hmm. Trump was not an agent like that. He, he was an asset. And that means he's sort of a friend. They come together time to time. They do favors mm -hmm. for each other. And it's expected to even out over the years. So. Um, I, I don't think wow. it was really, um, you know, you know the, the, first of all, the Russians did have powerful people in the business community. I'm thinking of a man named Armand Hammer who died a few years ago, but he was a, a great billionaire oil brand, a baron, uh, and he had uh, 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 very lucrative deals with the Soviet Union going back to the days of Joseph Stalin. Mm. And he died, I, I don't remember exactly the year he died, but but I felt that Trump was being groomed almost as a replacement for Armand Hammer when Hammer died, uh, to be a, a powerful person who knows what's going on in the business community. And then they got lucky. I mean, it turned out he yeah. uh, he made it into president, he became president. So so that's sort of the way that the, the Russians kind of build their compromise. Is it through finance? Or I also know that you talk about perhaps there's some honey trapping or perhaps I think this ties very much into the, the Jeffrey Epstein, uh, Jelaine Maxwell story, <laughs> especially especially about the guy. You, this to me blew me away that there was the, the Florida Palm Beach deputy sheriff was John Dugan. Who who right, got asylum right. in Russia? I, you 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 got to tell this is you got to tell that story as well. Sorry if I'm I'm forcing you to tell these things, but it's all building to to I think this bigger picture of of how we got here in this place right now. Right. Well, my book was called American Compromise, and the, and the word compromise is a uh, it means compromising material, and that does include honey traps, as, as you suggested. And the Epstein operation, there's still many, many unanswered questions about it. Uh, but I did get in touch with a man named John Mark Dugan, who had been deputy sheriff in Palm Beach County uh, when the Palm Beach uh, uh, Sheriff's Office was investigating uh, Jeffrey Epstein. And during that investigation, they collected hundreds and hundreds of videotape uh, 
of uh, uh, sex acts uh, that mm -hmm. were that were secretly recorded on Epstein's premises. Uh, John Mark Dugan was sort of the bad boy of the sheriff's department, and mm. he uh, either quit or was fired after the dispute. He, uh, uh, but he kept uh, in touch with friends there, and one one of them asked him to keep for safekeeping. Um, and, and this is what Dugan himself told me, mm -hmm. uh, uh, digitized videos of hundred, over 400 uh, sex acts that, that were, were taped uh, on Epstein's premises. And um, oh my God. John Mark Dugan uh, soon fled after getting those, fled Florida, for, first for Canada, and then he got the first flight he could to Moscow. Uh, and took with him, uh, or so he told me, all yeah. these hundreds and hundreds of sex tapes. Uh, I tracked him down by phone in, in Moscow, and we had a long talk. Um, he, um, the, the other interesting thing was if I, when I went to Dugan's Facebook page, I found photos of Dugan uh, sitting uh, in, in, a, in what appeared to be a business setting with a man named Pavel Barod. Pavel Broden is someone who's probably not familiar to most of your listeners, I don't but so. he's a very powerful in Putin's administration in Russia. He has oversight of all of Russia's uh, publicly held properties. Mm. And when you see uh, John Mark Dugan with this guy, the, the inevitable conclusion and I, uh, is, is Dugan selling them these sex tapes? Is that what's really going on? Uh, that's speculation on my part, but I did see one of the sex tapes, um, and uh, you know, it just raises an uh, this raises an awful lot of questions. Wait, you 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 saw one? You can show me one. It, it was a very grainy black and white uh, video. Uh, so grainy, it suggests it was done probably maybe in the 90s or something. It, it certainly didn't have the kind of technology you can get on uh, smartphones today. Uh, and uh, I don't know exactly who, who was the man involved. I was told it was a, a media executive, but I cannot corroborate his identity. Well, uh, wow. And then I'm just curious there. He, he sent this over. You had to watch this in person. Probably this is. No, no I, I, I watched it. He shared it on a, a, a link that I, he, he sent me. Well, so th this is a, uh, th this, cause that blew me away because the, in no world would a, just a random Florida sheriff be granted asylum in Russia alongside someone like <laughs> you know what I mean? Like Edward Snowden, one of the other four people. Yeah, but and Brittany Griner didn't get the same treatment. No, she, she didn't have tapes. She didn't have any compromise for them. All right. All right. Uh, uh, so, well, well, so is that what we're, is that what we're perhaps, de those some of the conclusions that you drew is that if they, in fact, do have this information, which obviously, you know, we, we constantly hear, oh, at least I see, in lockstep, the Republican Party goes on a coordinated attack whenever some new crime comes up. They say, well, it's time to release the Epstein client list, release the Epstein black book. But I'm always sitting here thinking that is going to reveal your president, Donald Trump, who is who is clearly and evidently involved with Jeffrey Epstein. So is this part of the Russian machine, the KGB, like they've just gathered all of this financial debt from Trump? They've got compromising videos of him. And is that how they've cultivated a bunch of unknowing or knowing assets in America? It's got to be. Well, I, I think it's, um, I think with Trump is a, is a very, very special situation, though I think they do have um, uh, hold over a lot of senators and a, a lot of people in the Republican Party still. Um, you know, I, how this plays out, I, I have no idea. <laughs> so many pieces are in motion and so much is yet to be revealed. I mean, again, when we talk about the what's in the headlines today, that, that it looked like there were nuclear secrets in the, in the 
uh, classified material at Mar-a-Lago. What does that really mean? Does that have to do with Saudi Arabia, or the Russians, or Korea? Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question, but I, I think there's uh, a lot of ways that uh, this information uh, has real value. And, and that clearly uh, Trump has been compromised again and again and again. Yeah, I think this will, I mean, this is the most evidence that, that we've ever had, concrete evidence that what other, what else is, I mean, seriously, what else is he doing with this this material, if not to sell it? or share it. And it's that kind of, you know, that kind of maybe draws me to my, my big theme here when I'm trying to trying to understand myself is that it like, it, are these Republicans and, and the Donald Trump, it almost seems like they are naturally like natural born Russian assets, meaning that every policy they suggest, or no matter what, what kind of talking points they give it, it always aligns with Russia. But I, it's like it's not even as if they're following Russia's orders. But you know they they blame America for the war in Ukraine. They say we need to stop funding Ukraine. They say we shouldn't have disarmed them. And and we have we we their right. their their natural rhetoric hurts America because it's it's this far right populist movement which helps Russia. So are they just naturally these Russian assets, or are they following orders? Which you said that would make them an agent, which I don't think they are. Well, well I, I mean, that, that's what I, I in, in my book, when you see how Trump was cultivated, it, it, it's not a mystery. I mean, I, I, I had long talked uh, with my, my major source on, on the last book was uh, Yuri Schwitz, who was a major in the KGB. And he'd been uh, at, at um, uh, Washington Station recruiting uh, and cultivating uh, spies for the former Soviet Union. So he, he, he was someone who was really well trained in that. And when you start talking about Donald Trump as a potential asset, I mean, you sort of break down in laughter because the, what you look for if you're trying to uh, yeah. recruit someone, well, uh, is he greedy? What do you think about that? Uh, <laughs> is Donald Trump greedy? Can he be wooed by money? Is he have weaknesses about women? Could he be lured into honey traps? Um, is he a narcissist? If you flatter him, is he subject to flattery? I mean, every question of this, when you when you talk about it with really hardened uh, intelligence operatives, they break down into laughter, saying that Trump was the perfect mark. Um, and and you see this a lot among other Republicans as well. I mean, the, the way they turn on a dime. What? Why is? Lindsey yeah. Graham done a complete 180. I mean, you can see, there's so many instances of this. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard to keep track of it them all. Right. The the I think Lindsey Graham, Ron Johnson went to Moscow in 2018, Fourth of July. Again, a very a, a subject that again, once again, the media just sort of moves on from. And then all of a sudden, there are these far. They've turned into far right, hard right politicians who are just promoting Russian talking points, which by the way, there's some people like Alex Jones of Infowars who receives a lot of his conspiracy theories from Russian state TV. I just had a, a Dr. Stephen Hassan on my last episode and, right. and, he, and he walked me through how, how it goes from Infowars, then to the, the far right channels, then the politicians pick it up and then Fox News brings it up and Tucker Carlson poses it as a question. So right. it's as if they are, they are picking up or it's if Russian interests and the far right have the same interests, and that is to destroy America's power on the world stage and to look inwards, to cut off alliances. Right, and we, we see, see that leading right up to January 6th with the tension yeah. building, building, and building, and going, as you say, from Alex Jones to Trump to January 6th. Mm -hmm. And then, so I, oh, one more thing I, I just had to ask because th th this struck me and, and this was again, an underreported story. But when, when, when Joe Biden was announced the winner of the election, Vladimir Putin put out a statement, I think through Reuters and he congratulated Biden. And to me, that was interesting. Cause I'm like, you know, if, if Donald Trump truly is there, is their golden boy, wouldn't he have wanted to spread the election <laughs> lie as well? Or it was interesting that he kind of said, all right, we're done with Trump now. He, he didn't even bother to spread the big lie. Right. I, I think he was keeping the door a bit open and, and uh, just in case. Uh, I mean, 
I, I don't think anyone knew how uh, it all played out. I, I'm not sure that Trump gets marching orders on a regular basis. I don't think it works <laughs> that way with Russia. But it, but there are times when he know he, you know he he's got a card to play and he knows how to play it, and he's he's very much in sync with with Putin. Yes, and so. Craig, my, I guess a final thing here, I'll close uh, on this, is that do you think Russia uh, got more out of this deal than, than they had hoped for with Donald Trump? Oh, or... I think they got much, much more out of Trump than they ever dreamed, but they, they were disappointed when he lost and mm -hmm. they want to keep it going as soon as possible. And, uh, you know, one, one thing I have to say among the, uh, the classified documents that Trump may have squirreled away at Mar-a-Lago that the FBI may have seized, I have to wonder, are there the notes of Trump's conversations with Putin, which have uh, been missing, of course, and not, not, no one has seen yet. And I, I have to wonder if that's part of the deal. Uh, did Trump secretly make any promises to Putin or not? And are they in those documents? Wait, wait, really quick. Uh, I think we don't know the, the secret notes with Putin. And what, what are we talking about there? Well, in, in one of his meetings with Putin, uh, Trump did not allow uh, the officially sanctioned U.S. American translator in. So the only uh, translation was done by Russia. So in other words, they have notes yeah. <laughs> of what, um, uh, what transpired, and we don't. Uh, unless Trump got them somehow. And there were other conversations with Putin and other world leaders. And uh, exactly what goes on in those conversations are carefully uh, documented. They are supposedly stashed away in, in, in a very secure uh, vault within the White House. Uh, what happened to them? Did Trump take them with him? Do they include promises he, he made uh, to North Korea, to Russia, or whatever. We don't really know. And, and uh, it, it's something the United States should know. And if Trump has those alone, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe those are in the safe as well as the nuclear codes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Christ. Well, I guess we'll, we'll find out, Craig. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come down one way or another. And um, when it's all said and done, uh, when they do eventually face the consequences for these crimes. It'll be interesting to see how Russia continues to try to manipulate our, our politics or if we can get them out. <laughs> right. All right, Craig, thank you so much for coming on. I, you're blowing my mind here. We'll Thanks for again. having me. I enjoyed it. Okay. <laughs> Take care. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to follow and subscribe to the show. Help spread the word about uncovering the truth by giving us a five-star review and sharing the show with a friend. We're available on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thank you for listening, and as always, I will continue to uncover the truth. The Uncovering the Truth theme song was created and produced by Pokari.